All right, so starting the recording, so dev team meeting, Tuesday, April the 23rd, so let's go with it. So I've got a few things to report on, several of the things I've been working on, and let's see if you wouldn't mind, please type in if you've got reports up on the front page there, so we can have that in the index. And otherwise I'll get started. So I've got a, several updates. On, I'm working on the production engineering of the 3D printer, just continuing developments on the next iteration. So some of the additions that are included right now since version 1902, so basically 1902. Um, let's, let's go take a look at that for a second. And let me share my screen. So share my screen. Oh, it's not letting me share my screen for some reason. Wait. There we go. Okay, so sharing the screen. Uh, let's go to D3D View 1902. Okay, so if you cut the screen, so some of the main updates here. Uh, main change since last time was uh, designing a, an extruder that's kind of more dedicated for what we're doing with the large sensor. Um, can take a look at the details. Now, it's, uh, since last time, what remains to be done on that? Uh, right now, working on a couple of good updates. One is an uh, insulated heat bed. And why is that? That's for, so I'll report an insulated heat bed here. Um, the reason for an insulated heat bed is uh, for energy conservation. If you want to get into printing of a lot of different things, energy efficiency does start to matter at a certain point. So if you do insulation on the bottom of a heat bed, this is the conceptual design here. But the idea being, uh, insulating would mean that you're not just throwing all that heat into the area around the printer, getting kept more. Uh, by the heated bed. So insulation from the bottom, obviously you can't uh, insulate from the top because that's where the print goes, but insulation from the bottom might save quite a bit. And I would, I don't know the exact numbers, but probably, I mean, it should be at least 50%. So it's two, a factor of two energy savings. Uh, if you combine it with a chamber that's enclosed and you're not going to be leaking all that heat away so that the bed, when it heats, it only has to heat a little bit to get work. So the idea being there, um, we've got the same bed like a metal plate, PEI surface, um, and a heater. So a heater could be uh, whatever we put there, but um, the idea for the insulation would be to use about 2 inches or 50 millimeters of rock wool. It se seems kind of excessive, but I mean this will add up if, if you go into larger printers and, and doing larger prints where you're printing all day. Um, energy efficiencies on that would be significantly because that is the main main cost of running a printer the if the nozzle is say 40 watts or 80 watts a heated bed is more like 200 watts or that's at the eight inch level if it's larger it's more than that it could be kilowatts so you want to be wasting all that heat uh, so the case for a heated bed that's got insulation is definitely there and that's um, that's what i want to do for the next iteration yeah I agree, loss for customers for an outdoor like environment printing. Uh, you know, somewhat hazardous materials and ABS and the rest. I, mean, I have mine in the garage and outbuild, mm -hmm. then they don't have to eat that outbuild like just to have robot run. So, yeah, super crucial and awesome idea. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, for example, and like when it was cold here, it was a hard time getting the heat bed to heat up at all to temperature. So. Here you yeah, that, that killed me working uh, this winter. I had, a, I had to eventually move my uh, hardware inside for the D3D Ohio during all that because I you know, couldn't get up the temperature. 
that you know, we'll call yeah. a file winner. Yeah, yeah. So definitely a good use case, especially if you know for open source ecology, we care a little bit about ecology as one of the aspects that that we worry about. Um, so yeah, that's uh, so, so the the thing here is just the insulation on the heat bed, and you can also enclose the entire printer for uh, just better better heat efficiency. Um, idea here right now is to 3D print this container here. So we've got this insulation here, and it could be any thickness, but I mean, I was thinking two inches. Because that, if you compare that to housing, that's R19. Uh, I think R19 means that heat will leak about that many, about 19 times less. So out of the bottom, you'll be leaking very much, just almost nothing. Um, so print this tree print is structured. We have these uh, structures here that would snap right into the just wanted to show this detail here. So on the bottom of this 3D printer structure, you would have structures that snap right to the rods of the Z-axis, the, the support rods, so that get away from, I think someone was um, not, oh yeah, I think Eric mentioned, we got to fix the connection of the rods to the bed. This actually addresses that here. You can 3D print this and make it basically have that snap onto the rods, because that part here is cool. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, melting. So, so this part here can be plastic because we're insulated from the heat. And there's a little heat insulator, insulator spacer of the hot plate, and I have a nichrome heater doing the job here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. I was thinking that at the larger scale, when we go to larger beds like one meter printer, um, a bed like that would be for one very expensive. And possibly not not to be sourced anywhere or hard to source so it's a good idea to start getting into nichrome heaters you can click on that link but I looked at a little bit and a standard for what I've seen people do is having um, like this one here in this example you can look on the wiki page but a specific example has where you have the fiberglass sleeve you wrap the wire around that uh, essentially to reduce the lamp because uh, the lens the working lens on a, are on a, around five meters or so 10 15 feet or so uh, so to shorten that up what they what people usually do is wrap it around an inner inner fiberglass sleeve so you, you'd like maybe one third one quarter one fifth the length is needed because you're wrapping it around like a helix and then put another sleeve of the fiberglass around that because the nichrome, bare nichrome, we're talking about bare nichrome here, that would be conductive so that you get the electricity running through that. Um, that's a basic thing. Um, then you connect the copper wire. The best way to do that is you don't want to do uh, a bed level, you don't want to do solder because solder can melt with a high nichrome temperature. You want to just uh, wrap the wires around each other and put probably like a sleeve, uh, a metal sleeve uh, butt connector. Uh, that you crimp on so that you have a solid contact so there's a little bit of technique to this because we're getting into the idea that you've got high temperature elements that uh, the heat uh, can make the connections loose so you have to pay attention to that but this this kind of thing would be scalable from small heater elements to large ones uh, did some calculations on that for the one that I'd like to build at the 8 inch bed would be about 10 feet about 3 meters of of nichrome uh, gauge 31 I was looking at 30 gauge actually uh, and that should be about the right thing for 120 volts 500 watts so 500 watts is now getting serious that's a fast heating bed that means uh, we're going to be getting the bed to heat up as quick as the heater the extruder here um, in other words, like a minute instead of like 10 minutes. So basically you, you fire the printer up and it gets going pretty quickly. Uh, whereas a lot of times it's you're, you're waiting a long time for the heat, in, heat bed. So the idea here is to use 500 watts. Typically the heaters use either like 100, 200, maybe 300. Uh, standard 12 volt heaters that we have actually right now, I mean the 12 volts uh, we're only getting about 100, as far as uh, I could see, we're getting about 120 watts out of that. It's only like 8 amps. 
if you yeah, those numbers. I can look at the industrial side of things, uh, what we're using here, but um, you know, nichrome is a typical um, industrial here, uh, uh -huh. used inside of a uh, injection mold molding process where they need to get a uh, mold machine. It's a typical use case for, you know, if you want to do a uh, cross study here, yeah. injection equipment is critical because when we do a tool change, they need that heated up ASAP. I mean, that's that's their big, yeah. you know, their, their big dollars there. So, um, yeah, and that's a good cross study. And, uh, you know, 110 and for this also, um, I think it's more on, I think it's definitely more in pissy uh, than voltage here. Uh, you know, for instance, a, um, a system that melts aluminum ingots in the mute and aluminum uh, process for turning uh, alumina or whatever it is into or, or smelting it. It's a uh, 3000 amps at five volts, <laughs> stuff like that. So um, really here it's, um, push more amps through a wire, um, we can get at a higher heat and, um, you know, avoid larger gauges of wire. And um, I just kind of know that, I have to look into that, because I'm kind of just speaking from memory, it might be inaccurate, but that's something to consider. Yeah, 120 volts get us, gets us more power with less current, so that's that means that uh, part of the, the idea of going to 120 volts is mean, that means you can make the power supply much smaller. So, ah, there you go. So, yeah, we don't have industrial power supplies. Yeah, <laughs> okay, right. right. So if you look at the numbers, if we were to do this, so so the best I found was actually Ultimaker. They brag about their bed getting heated up in like about the same time as their nozzle. And I looked at that. They have a, they use apparently a 500 watt heated bed. It's, it's uh, I think 120 it is. But if you were, if you were to do that off 24 volts, uh, for for 500 watts, that's 20 amps. I mean, at 12 volts, it would be pretty much impossible. At like 40 amps, that's pretty. It's quite that's a bit. But basically, uh, now, yeah, instead of running it through the power supply, we get it off the mains power. That means the power supply. So for the version 19.04 of 3D, which I'm doing right now, and I should get this built by May 1st. Um, I'm just doing all these upgrades on the, the, the control panel and all this. But the, the idea there is only a 4 amp 24 volt power supply is sufficient. So we're going to 24 volts, which also helps the stepper motors um, move faster at, at higher speeds. So that will, um, 4 amps compared to current power supply, which is 30 amps at 12 volts, because we're also heating the bed with it. So definite major simplification on the power supply level um one of the reasons so so we basically want to get the the state of art in terms of speed of heat up here and easier on electronics so uh, next slide is actually the 3d printed control panel um i have uh, some of the thing uh, I, i'm putting it all into to freak out actually so I, I picked off a lot of this from from grabcad and some of these things i drew up like first thing i just mocked up a power supply which is basically one of these small <coughs> boards um if you go to so yeah. that makes sense yeah it's i see like it looks like a crydon ssr or something yep, like that yep, yep. and uh those yeah i mean that's the general thing uh yeah because i mean if we are doing this we can definitely use yeah even a mosfet process um device if we can screw into a block of metal because like really i mean our you know our goal of course is to get down minimum parts that electrical parts or vitamins that we have to get from mass industry and right. have use those drive the cost low and have minimum amounts of those around so i'm trying to think i'll put that on my back burner what kind of because i'm around this stuff every day i should yeah. be able to find it not yeah. everyone is yeah. So the kind of supply that we need now is just this kind this tiny little board like this uh, and I picked one here, no, not the right length. It's a, a tiny board. It's much smaller than the standard power supplies that we've been using. Um, I'm going to go back to the 24 volt power supply page. Uh, yeah, right here. Um, no, not this. Voltage smaller than the wiring you need, yep. and uh, 120 volt 
Now let me go back to my log here and I want to show you the, the, what the power supply now goes to be. Um, one twenty volt heat bed. I think I have it there. Um, three D printed control panel. Because I want to three D print control panel. Um, okay, it's in this document right here. So. I'm going to go into this. So this is on a page called 3D Printer Control Panel. So it's control panel with all the elements, but I want to 3D print all that. And that's why I'm getting this up in 3CAD so that I can put in all holes for mounting all components right through 3D print. So that's that's the reason for that. Um, this is the former. That's V1902 that we've done. A plexiglass drilled hole. So you have to basically measure and drill all those holes. Well, let's print it. Um, that, that's easier. So, uh, the one that I'm actually this is this okay this this one's dual power supply. I want to show you this one, but it's a tiny thing. It's it's a little board, but it pr puts out 24 volts for the um, steppers and everything else. It also has a another outlet at 12 volts, like one amp, so you can power the Arduino because the Arduino can only take 12 volts. So this will have both here. Like you see the blue terminals at the bottom, they have both 12 and, and 24. And that transformer, that yellow thing, it's a 24 volt, 4 amp, 12 volt, 1 amp. But this tiny thing is sufficient for what we need right now. Um, so that's, that's pretty good. Now, uh, just a couple of details. How do you fit? So if we've got 8 inch printers. Your screen, uh, your screen uh, tapped out on me. Did it? Yeah, yeah sorry. Maybe other people can, but I think it's yeah, it's it should be sharing still. Um, so so if you do a 3D print control panel, you gotta fit all these things here. The big solid state relay would be for the heat bed. These are your individual type of drivers that go on the ramps. Here's the ramps right there. Uh, here's the power supply that I just drew that up off the dimensions from the, the Amazon sourcing. Uh, now, if you use a printer with a 12-inch frame, the control panel, in order to fit, it would have to snap it. Like, I want to do it like a snap-in thing. Don't have to drill the frame anymore. Just snap it in and hang it by, um, basically, like, snap around the frame. So as you can take it on and off very easily. But it has to be 10 inches. How do you do a 10-inch heated bed on an 8-inch bed? Well, one way to do it is stand it up vertically and do it do it across long way the basically diagonally on the heated bed so we can print up to it's us 1.4 times 8 so about 12 inches of length if we print diagonally on an 8 inch bed so we can still print that on an 8 inch printer even with the heat the control panel is going to be like 10 inches so that's that's that so yeah, 3D printed control panel, uh, putting that all into forget so it should be all updated. Hopefully um, I'll have that um, by next time. The last thing, well next to last thing is, um, so I just did a conceptual design of the rubber optimized extruder. So what that means is that, um, so this is your separate motor in green, uh, I want to do dual drive gears. So, um, instead of one driving from one side, you drive from both sides of more force. And therefore, you can use larger heater blocks when we're pushing the limits of 3D printing. Now, to do rubber, you want to confine the path so, so right as soon after you drive the filament machine and back here, it goes into a structure that's that's the cooling heat sink, and the heater block is right beneath that. So, if you notice, like if you kind of look at the details, the path between drive gears and the heater block is absolutely minimum. It can be while allowing the, the heat sink to, to so cool that so you don't, you're not melting the filament right after the drive gears. Uh, just a concept, I want to draw this up. I was thinking about this with the fans on the side, um, blowing on a heat sink, and that would be a thing we'd have to mill out. But D3D CNC circuit we could mill aluminum, small aluminum. We could do that, so we can do a heat sink from that. Now, the one thing that I'm showing here 
based on a conversation with Jihad, the people who make jihad, the Jihad extruders, uh, met them at the Midwest Rap Festival. Uh, what they do is they don't screw in their extruders or no nozzles. Yes, they do screw in, but but the extruder they clamp. They use clamping instead of threading, for the reason that threads are not a good thermal contact. So, on the hot side, you try to heat the the a, a thing that's going through the heater block, but it's threaded, so the, the heat contact is not the best. And we're cooling. If you have threads, then the contact to the cooling part is also not the best. So I'm, okay. So what about if we clamp? Don't use a threaded. Uh, heat break, the song thing, they have a long heat break that spans all the way to the nozzle from where the filament enters, but that's smooth, it's not threaded. Just slip it in, tighten some bolts on the side, so that means the the metal there, the aluminum would have to be slitted. And then you're just grabbing onto your long heat break. I don't want anyone doing this, but according to J-Head people, uh, that was Nick, I met her, uh, that's a good way to go. Uh, he, we were discussing how E3D does that they have everything threaded and for us one of the problems with thread is we can never get the right angle for the correct angle for the heater block so we have to unscrew it and fix it sometimes because you can't you don't know the thread's gonna where you're gonna turn where it's gonna end up and what angle and if you have something right next to it like our cooling fan not shown here but uh, uh, it would interfere so you want to have it in a predictable place you can't do it with threads easily so that's just a practical thing that you have to address yeah. Yeah. That's the thing with like a thermal connectivity. If you have a, a fluid heating your thing, you want to have lots of channels for maximum surface area or fluid yeah. of air going yeah. from something to maximum surface area. But threads, um, you don't have continuous contact. So, yeah, I can see what that means. Yeah. yeah, threads don't have a continuous contact, they only touch in certain places, and the rest is air gap. So, you know, you think that, you know, you do a bolt into a nut, it's all connected, but no, there is an air gap, only a part of the the threads are connect actually making physical contact with, or with the nut and a thread so that's interesting i didn't think about that but uh since you guys brought it up and it seemed like they know what they're doing and it's definitely worth trying and, and i do like it because it's not easy to thread when you have wires on this uh heater block because you've got heater element inside the heater block and the thermistor thread threading then for all that distance is not you know it takes time it, you have to pay attention to where your wires are so you don't break them. So just slipping it in would be a really good way and you just clamp clamp down some bolts. So here's bolts that clamp down on the heat sink part and here are two bolts that clamp down on a heat block. Now the way Jihad does they have a press fit. Here I have clamped bolts. Press fit means you can't really remove it. We like to have it removable. Um, so that's that's the that's just the concept, and now let's go and CAD free CAD and see what, how the geometry actually works out in practice. So that will be the next step. Okay, last thing I want to share is um, so looking at 3D printable motors. So one thing is um, so William Neal from the OSC Club of London International Academy in Canada. He's produced the Hallock Array motor, which is 3D printed with a PLA core, and he's. Let's get all, um, okay, so if you want to take a look at that, to the 600 watt 3 printed motor, uh, and you'll see this all over the internet. So this is, you, you probably have seen this. Uh, Hi, how are you? Uh, so this, this kind of motor, uh, crazy thing, it's a pretty sophisticated thing. This is 3D printed with all these magnets and the core. Uh, so that's one way to do it, and William Neal has done that up in Canada there, so we're planning on doing that for the summer camp, uh, building that. But there's an easy way, actually an easy way to go. So you see this, this is quite sophisticated. That's the Hallbuck Array uh, s style motor. Um, that looks like... 3D printed like that. Okay, but looking into that, I was searching around, okay, what else can you do? So I ran into this one, and this somewhat blew me away because the performance of this looks really good. So the former one, the, the Hallback Ray motor, 3D printed one, is 80% efficient. This one right here, uh, you can click on that, and it's uh, amazingdiyprojects.com. 
Oh, there's actually plenty of them for five bucks for this. I think I'll probably get this. Um, but if you look at the performance, 500 watts at 2,500 RPM at 33 volts. Now that's pretty amazing for a very simple design of a simple disc with the actually the same magnet we used on D3D. So the half inch three millimeter neonium magnets and coils and then electronic control because this is uh, electronically controlled. You have to turn on the coils at a particular sequence. But look, I mean, look at that, 73% efficient. Price would be like $6 in magnets, and then there's just some metal and a bearing or two, and a simple control with a couple of MOSFETs and batteries. And if you want to see this go, I mean, this is insane. If you want to click play on that, <laughs> that one, this thing is a real airplane. Yeah, I mean, that's insane. It's so 500 watts. Uh, now, look at that. So that's about one-fifth the cost of the uh, Haubach array motor. Uh, looks like it's about twice as energy dense for the weight. I mean, the Haubach motor is actually much bigger. This is much smaller. Um, looks like a competitor. Definitely worth doing. This gets us into uh, simple electron controls. At 500 watts, that gets us into completely usable power. We can put our gear down on that. And uh, this is very exciting. But this is for real. I mean, the, the numbers here are pretty good. It's now 70% efficient. You know, the best motors are like 85, maybe 95. Uh, but only 50% efficient for a very simple design like this. I think that's, that's pretty good. Uh, and of course, we can improve that. But that's just like first super simple, you know, the, the gutter design. <laughs> But the guy who's doing this, he's actually pretty good. He's, uh, I mean, he's, uh, if you want to get a load of what, what this guy does, this guy's making this big drone that he flies in with that. So that's a drone with like, um, like a hundred little propellers. So this guy's pretty crazy. Uh, if you go to his YouTube channel, the drone is on his front cover there, but but that's his latest project. So this guy is into bigger motors too. So so he's actually got plans for a 10 kilowatt motor, like I showed you the 500 watts. Um, the next version up is like 10 kilowatts. So really serious stuff. So look at this guy with uh, this quadcopter that's got like a hundred of his little wings and he flies it. So that's he went like 50 kilometers per hour or so in this um pretty cool um definitely worth worth uh st starting to get into this and it will be a good project for the summer school to do so a bit of that uh looks really good as far as a uh, super easy to in terms of conceptual design we can of course now 3d print this is like built out of wood but this is quite 3d printable just print out all the parts in uh, with a 3d printer and start playing with uh, DIY electrical power, electrical motors, which uh, I was actually quite surprised because this is really a combining 3D printing and this basic design idea that we have now power transistors and things like timers like Arduinos or 555 timer chips that you can run this now to get at this level, it's almost industrial performance, but the, the, his bigger 10 kilowatt one is absolutely industrial performance. So the news is that it's becoming very accessible to do all these kinds of high-tech things if you know what you're doing. Because it took me actually quite a bit of time to find this on the internet, uh, searching because most of it is just you run into a lot of, a lot of rubbish, lots of half, half bakery kind of stuff, but then again you run into it once in a while. Just amazing stuff if you're intent on finding that because I was thinking, okay, well, there's got to be an easy way to do this. Just this very simple axial flux kind of a design. Typically, the, like the Halbacher, that's a radial flux motor. The magnetic field is pointing out. This is like here. In this case, the magnetic field is along the axis. It's axial flux. Um, much simpler design. 
lower cost, still really good performance. So yeah, there's, uh, basically there's a hundred ways to do things, and curiosity always helps to uncover what's what can really work. Okay, so I think I'll leave it at that for on my side, and uh, I'd like to hear some more reports from other people. Um, John, do you want to continue and update? Don't you been to? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've actually uh, prototyped a uh, language uh, for the open source uh, manufacturing education execution system um, to uh, help us um, track the entire assembly process. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a sample XML file on my uh, slide uh, down there uh, in our presentation. Mm -hmm. It currently lives. Let's see, pop open that uh, XML file. Mm -hmm. So what's this look like? So, um, let's tell us about it. What, what's happening? So what's happening um, is this breaks out any product in the world. Uh, any product you have, you're going to have parts that are going to be assembled at a certain station. And they're going to have certain assembly instructions executed apart upon them. And so I think you have a database to have for some workshop or whatever factory it is, is, hey, here's what you have on hand. Your parts, they're located here. I mean, of course, it's a whole location tracking track and trace system for the MES, but this is just the bare, bare bones of it. So let's just consider like D3 Ohio. We have a control board. You have uh, five universal axes that have, you know, a certain length to them. There's a certain type of it. So as we said, there's tons of versions for every single part. Mm -hmm. that's ever made and then you have a pvc frame and so i think you see a super and then there's assembly instructions and those are just something to send to the machine the machine's going to understand if the mes really doesn't know what it is but it can send it to the machine in this case it's just a workbench it's just a table that just uh pretty much instructs you know someone more walking up to the table i envision just monitor sitting there and that's what's going to happen you know, the business, and it's going to show a monitor. Someone's going to walk up to it. It's going to say, hey, it's what you need. Bring it here. And so considering all these parts are on hand, they just would grab them from stock. They're already produced. But they're not produced. Here's where it gets interesting. So if you consider the second part there, the universal access all bench, mm -hmm. what's going to happen with that is then the machine would get the XML file that had that part DB reference the top and so then it would take that apart and look at okay what are the parts and assembly instructions and then it would just keep going down the line recursively until you have tons of, three, tons of circuit mills routing circuit boards and basically everything kicked off or you're enabling a person with a workshop and with a large queue of online orders or in-person or phone orders, you're enabling that person to manage their work day mm -hmm. and be effective to produce all that giant demand. You know, even in your case, when you have hundred orders, hundreds of orders for printers, basically. So, you know, we take this language, we write it out, say here's this, here's this, here's this, and the instructions should just be PDFs, and that manages the whole process from beginning to end. Then all you just have is a database of, hey, we have this much. So I think you can. Does that kind of make sense? Is that easy uh, to follow? Yeah. Uh, how? So this is an XML file. How how will the system be running? Is it like in a web browser? So is it online? Yeah. It's a uh, so way in ten. This is going to be all Python. Um, the base MES system is going to digest these. So. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at OpenCart is uh, how I'm going to deploy my website. It's an open source web store. Um, that was in my previous meetings. I had yep. that you might have saw those. Um, yeah, completely Linux based, all the rest, and thought of a website. I'll find some way to host it. And then basically that comes down line to the NES system. And the start, you know, it's going to take the orders that are going to relate to XML files in the database. As some sort of program, programmatic database that's going to be able to, I'm going to utilize the NES software I have and Octoprint to be able to manage uh, three printers 
and uh, perhaps also the circuit mills to start. Yeah. So this that just kicks off the whole thing for basic on Asian um, for a um, you know managing whole thing. It's just hey, we select the parts, we put them out. So that's that's that. That's in the works. That's going. I'm you know suggesting Octavent and all the rest of these things start to get this kicked in. And, I'm going to integrate it with an online store. It's just going to be super simple. Like I have, it's probably going to start just a couple D three D rated parts for you access that I'll have online. Um, you know, maybe you're interested in ordering them, or someone else is interested in ordering them. Those will be up there, ready to go. Um, yeah. So that's that. Um, next things. The uh, what do you like? For example, open yeah. part. Like, would you be talking to it through Python or? No, how, how um, I'm, I'm uncertain how I'm gonna, you know, write that integration. It may be, um, I'm not sure how messaging would come down from the site quite yet. I'm um, gonna get into that crossword when I come to it. But right now, I kind of know my technologies is Octoprint, it's ready to it does what I want. And a module probably to can continuously print or send it jobs. But um, it's gonna kind of evolve from there. And then all of those uh, D3D printers are gonna have those. Uh, Raspberry Pi of some sort basically be the machine controller. Mm -hmm. I'd like to use something like that. That that probably Raspberry Pi would probably end up being the main controller I'm gonna have with lots of machines and if I need IO or something or just a off process that's too fast for that to be able to handle it probably just be an Arduino just to keep things simple and it would probably be product early products of the factory. But I mean yeah, that's general gist and just trying to start small, just to take it something continuously printing on one printer but you know starting off with this type of language is the right way to do it mm -hmm. it would just be like that assembly instruction I mean you can I think you can see it like here's the this file here's where it lives on the computer and just send that to Octoprint so that would be the assembly instructions file it would just be decode more or less or something else to kick it off but mm -hmm. yeah it's just a recurrence of Paul part modeling language you know, that can be written in XML that lots of people understand and you can read it, some and write it pretty easily, that we can use to start describing all these products and just, you know, eventually the idea is you order something and, you know, but in your lab you can order for a hundred workshops, have people are coming, oh, now all your printers are kicking out parts. Mm -hmm. Boom. So, I have one more thing uh, to show. Um, mm -hmm. I've done really weird stuff with my printer. I might email you a couple days. Um, it seems to work so far, and you can actually get a print out. But I definitely have my printer at 90 degree angle, and uh, I definitely that's on the uh, the left side, the uh, second bullet point on the left. Um, mm -hmm. and I, yeah, so I have that you know at angle, and then I have a coupling rod between the Y. And between the Z, so there's no torsion. So I have two less motors in my printer. Um. And uh, that rod's reducing the torsion because I don't have gravity. And because I don't have gravity weighing down the Z axis or the Y axis, just the X axis, there's lots of stress on this. And uh, printer prints fine ABS at an angle. Uh, are you saying you're doing this? Uh, it, it's so far I can move the axes. I don't have a video of it, so no, no proof. But um, yeah, I can definitely move my axes with this cobbling rod. Um, I'm not but, seeing uh, the people seeing what that's about. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you turn it on on the side somewhere, then something is gonna get the gravity, right? So I'm not seeing how. Uh, just, just the x-axis, not the z. The z is no longer supporting the weight of that in the part. And then if you flip it in such a way that only the X is moving up and down, uh, well, 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 it's currently up and down, no, uh, then, yeah, then the Y doesn't have to <laughs> gravity either. And then you have, a, then you put a rod between the motors, and then you need two less motors, because they have that much less of a load, and there's not, uh, you know, dis oh, I see. Thing, when I thought about it, there's this continuity. <laughs> It really doesn't work unless you have a metal rod going between the two, because then you have to torch. <laughs> but that resolves saying. the problem. Yeah, um, you get it. And so yeah. if you can try that, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I obviously don't really work as much of this as I really want to. I'm like, 
like half an hour game or something. But <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. that'd be. I think that's that's looking pretty good. I, motors do move when I uh, JB weld with them together. JB weld with the axes on, or just a rod, a metal rod connecting them. So if it doesn't even need to be a ninety. Doesn't even need to be ninety degrees. Can be like less than ninety. But yeah, because then all you need to do to knock off parts is just barely touch them with the head, and they would just grab the ground. So what about it. Um, what about the ex the additional challenge? Like if it's at ninety, then you're you're printing the prints at ninety, so therefore the gravity will affect the prints. How do you address that? Uh, yeah, so looking up plenty of uh, YouTube videos, that appears to not affect printing ABS at all in many cases. Yeah, no, that's interesting. It just is. Um, it sounds like a like that's a use case that would be valid for some definitely valid in some places. Yeah, interesting. If I, but yeah, I'm definitely gonna do it. And I'll let you guys know. That's what this is all about. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> I, think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna end up two less motors, which will be huge. Mm-hmm. And I mean that's huge if we don't have, if we don't have to have those motors. And I think I have a mm-hmm. simple way to eject parts. So yeah. it's gonna be nice. It's really weird. But yeah. No, that's interesting. That's that could yeah, yeah. yeah. Let us know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all. Okay. Uh, I got a question on XML. So, is XML yeah. the preferable language? Is that, or did you consider yeah, anything else? I've uh, I've uh, done research that may have been made to my blog. Mm-hmm. Attack blog. Well, let's see. Let's see about what I need to do. Share at this point. Yeah, might not have made it in there, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, I, I've looked at a couple other languages. And just like I, I think with me, if anything like this, what I thought from industrial go, I want things to be super simple as I can. Mm-hmm. Not, I mean, there's lots of languages that try to do all this kind of stuff, and they have them, but they're getting kind of esoteric. And I kind of just want to keep it, yeah, general real, really simple. <laughs> And just, you know, knock out as much complexity as I can. Mm-hmm. And just that it, it fulfills the need, and I don't see what I'm going to have to deal with for, like, I don't see any pitfalls yet, so I'll work with it and see where I can get. Um, but definitely there's, like, other XML derivatives or other just, just the whole concept here is just data modeling or data structure languages. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't see much change, but, uh, Oh, thanks, guys. I got to get uh, back to it at the office. So okay. See you guys. Thanks Good a meeting. lot, John. Mm-hmm. Welcome. Okay, excellent. So who wants to go next? Uh... Hey, hi, Gil. Did I sound yeah. okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I sent the follow-up email to the contact list. Um, so I gave them a lot of information and... Uh, I have a survey, a Google survey, that if people have an interest in, um, you know, classes or getting involved, they could uh, fill that out. So I just sent out the email two days ago, and I've only had one survey response. But I think in the next few days, there'll be a few more. Um, so that was kind of wrapping up the uh, Expo stuff. And uh, now I'm going to get into ordering the remaining parts <laughs> for the Volcano Extruder um, and then start building that. So I got the 3D printed parts from um, the library. So supposedly I should be able to print them myself. Um, but, yep, that's uh, what's going on. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So are you still using then the Prusa Extruder and you're adding the, the Volcano Nozzle to it? Um, or I'm using the, like, I think it's 1902, um, is where the new nozzle assembly came from. The new extruder, you mean the Titan Arrow, you're, you're migrating to that? Uh, it's a volcano, uh, E3D volcano, 
So I'm gonna just build a new extruder and uh, swap out swap out the whole extruder. Uh, so you're gonna use the E3D volcano nozzle. That's the heater block, and then the extruder part on top of that. You're gonna move from the the Prusa to the to the Titan Arrow from E3D. Uh, I guess I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is so yours working? So as far as uh, how well is it working? I mean, do you have a retraction enabled, and that's all going well? <coughs> yeah, it seems to be working. Um, you know, just pulling the z-axis is the difficult part. Um, so that's lined up. Um, the prints weren't. If it's uh, not quite lined up, then mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't quite lay it down right. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping with this next assembly, I guess uh, the Z-axis is kind of automatically um, lined up. The, uh, the sensor um, has the holder where yeah. um, the height is kept constant. Yeah, yeah. Well, you still have to do the, the first layer, but if you're using... Let's see, did you upgrade the code to i don't think we have wait did we have the baby stepping correction when we built that that was in september or that we didn't have that, i don't believe that's in there no we didn't we didn't so the newest version like if you, you take the the firmware from 1902 or uh after 18.10 that has this thing where on the first layer it's a thing called it's called baby stepping correction you turn the knob and if the layer is per not perfectly the first layer is not perfectly on the bed you just turn the knob to adjust it and it works beautifully so oh, yes. yeah and then, so that takes that whole process from having to do multiple times where you print once and try to print again and again you do it in real time live right there and you get the perfect thing, then you just save it, and that's it. So, okay. yeah, that workflow is now really good. So, so is that in a in the G code, or you said that's Marlin? For that's in Marlin. So Marlin, we had to. What happened there was we had to switch to a little uh, to uncon something and configuration advanced. I think it was in. All it is was commenting one line to enable the baby step correction, which, um, which is in, in Marlin and stock Marlin already. So that's really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's that code. Cool. That. Yeah, yeah. So that you just need to download, like, say, download the 1902, and that that should work for the the Marlin 1902. So um, let's see if we go 3D V. 19 point 02 you should have a link right there to the code uh, so yeah uh, code okay. point number five <coughs> marlin v19 to that zip just need to upload it to to the arduino to the ramps the arduino ramps and there you go okay i'll try that uh, upgrade i just want to build this um next extruder yeah, something with the. Uh, I just thought of something real quick. This tack is the uh, yeah. Z height center. Yeah. Does, does your embed ever? Does your printer ever like dim the display or like get have lower power when it's um not sensing something? No. That looks like it's like some picture current draw or something. No, I don't know what that's about. I haven't seen that personally. It sounds like an electrical problem of some sort. Yeah, I have to keep looking. Yeah, I don't know. Yep. All right. Well, that sounds good. Um, thanks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, anyone else? Ruslan or Anthony? Is it Ruslan, Eric? I wasn't clear on this. No, Eric is Polly. Oh, Eric's Polly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I can just what I've been doing over here in Ottawa. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, I went to a meeting today at the the MakerSpace North to secure a space for uh, building the meetup, the local chapter. And, but it's not until next month that we're going to start meeting there. Uh, 
that's been projective. Six times we've been doing it anyway. Yeah. I'm Matt. Uh, Devin. You uh, talking about Matt Broder? Um, no, it's a different name. Let's see if I can get his name here. Uh. Yeah. And Devin, Devin, as in who used to live in Milwaukee? School of Engineering? Or a different Devin? Um, no, different than Devin. Uh, no, it's different Devin. It's Matt's friend. Okay. Okay. Matt Sear. C Y R is his last name. He went to with the uh, tractor assembly uh, thing. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, the so the micro track? Uh, yeah, the micro track. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, so yeah, so I met those two guys. Uh, yeah. I need to meet some more people and get more action happening here, so that may help to have a good work uh, meeting place. Yeah. And I signed the form. Yeah. Um, so. Well, what city are you in? Seth, Matt, I'm in Ottawa now. Okay. Um. So yeah, aside from that, we did a little bit of the stuff of the casting. Did some research there. Martian's aware of what's up, but anybody else um, who's not aware, we're looking at using uh, calcium aluminate cement and filler instead of plaster of Paris to enable steel casting. Uh, I guess for the workshop that's coming up, and I don't know, but certainly it's really useful. For MIG, I just got yeah. To... yeah, the idea there yeah. is just testing out whether MIG casting works at all. So we're trying to get our hands on a formula where we could make some cement as a mold. Um, so, yeah, and does Menards or any of those stores have any of these refractories or like some, some that we can just go to local store or something? Yeah, they have similar stuff. They usually contain silica, which is a kind of a bummer, but it's probably fine. It's not, it's probably a good idea. It might not be a bad idea to just order some stuff off Amazon for 50 bucks or something. They do use calcium aluminate cement. Um, but they also use fillers or like silicate. So if you uh, put it in, what's wrong with silicate? Does that bad? Silicate is okay, um, right? That's sand, right? It uh, works okay. It's just it, it starts to crack at I think 1,100 degrees. It has various phase transitions. The crystalline structure changes, and uh, that causes distortion, and so the little grains tend to crack. Silicate is a uh, OSHA inhalation uh, hazard too. Well, I wouldn't call it silicate. I would call it silica. Silica. Um, yeah. Yeah. Silicon dioxide. It's just sand. Yeah. Like sand. you say. But it has. Yeah. So it's not. I mean, it's just not the ideal filler. The ideal filler is something more like alumina, or zirconia. Is something that's just never been produced. Just ideal. Well, they don't do anything at all. They're just inert. They don't do any phase changing. Uh, they don't undergo phase transitions. Mm -hmm. um, they're Especially stable. zirconia. Yeah, they're stale. Mm -hmm. Zirconia actually has a small amount of yttrium uh, added to it to stabilize it against any phase transitions. The pure zirconia actually does have some uh, phase transitions. Mm -hmm. But they pretty much always have that stuff. So, yeah. Do you have access to a welder anywhere there, Anthony? Nope. I do not, unfortunately. We don't have any that kind of stuff here. I'm... I got my little box at Matt's place, and that's in major progress for me. I'm sitting it now. You can see in the background of my camera. Um, so, but you've got the Mega Mig there, eh? That would be a good thing to use. It would be a pretty good power output. Melt lots of steel quickly. Get it into the mold. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Anything, uh, I don't know, two and a half Miller Max would work well on that. Yeah. So yeah, we wanna. And try that to see if we if it's worth pursuing for the camp. Otherwise, we can c continue with uh, zinc aluminum as the low lower melting temperature. Yeah. So to be determined. Um, yeah. I'm are you seeing it. are you waiting on a response from the other guys or do they respond? Um. I have not, I don't think I've gotten any news back from the eBay guy or from the uh, manufacturer of. The uh, calcium aluminate, the pure calcium aluminate scent. 
Right. No, I haven't. Oh, no, he did. Do you have, okay. uh, do you know any foundries around you or any people who do jewelry casting? Because they, they work with this kind of stuff. You could just stop into a local shop of some That's sort. That's what I was thinking. Um, dental cast, another thing. Um, do you use the dental material that I have this zinc phosphate cement, which is also interesting. I don't know if it's suitable for steel. I have to do some more research on that. But, uh, yeah, it's a different show with these. Is there um, anyone that does casting in stainless steel? Because that would be the territory. Yeah, that's the sort of thing that would work. Um, I don't know of anybody locally, but certainly I could, uh, could look for that sort if of thing, you, I guess. If you want to do some research where you can probably get some answers, that would be the place to go Go to a, uh, I mean, call up find a couple of foundries that work with steel, like stainless steel is popular for... Um, well, they use a different process. A foundry will use a different process. They usually use uh, colloid bonded or silicate bonded materials. They don't, this, they don't use block testing, cause it, but it required the water evaporate from the surface of the, uh, the object. Uh, so we'll be, repeat that, so what kind? So silicate bonded cements? Um, yeah, one of the nicest binders is colloidal silica or colloidal zirconia because the little tiny colloidal particles will bind to each other. They form a gel when the uh, when the, the colloid is destabilized and it can be destabilized by the removal of water or by a change in pH or by any of like a dozen different me mechanisms. Um, so you don't actually have to remove the water to get it to gel. Mm -hmm. There are some examples that I've read that were kind of buried of people who are trying to use this for block casting. Uh, they used uh, like agents that would cause a pH change after a certain time delay. But um, yeah, this is kind of complicated. I was the kind of process. fan of the CIC material because it's just like, just like plaster of Paris. You just have... Yeah, because colloidal like silica, you can get that online easily. I'm looking at Amazon here. Um, yeah, you can. The thing is getting that. It's like... Uh, well, because one way could be more like an investment casting route where you, you're saying like you make a shell around the 3D object. Yeah. Because then you can burn you can, out the object, right? And then you can... There's a process involved there. The intermediate stage is to sinter it. You actually do have to sinter it. And that requires baking it in an oven at a very red-hot temperature for some time. Whereas with block, you don't have to do that because, you, because the strength comes from the the CAC. Yeah. It it's in the crystals join each other. Whereas with the invest casting, the colloidal silica has a little bit of strength, but it's only just enough to hold it together for long enough to center it. So mm -hmm. that's the problem with that. So you can use colloidal silica. What is the thing that you actually center? Um, it's a lot of the time it's just silica. Uh, but uh, zirconia is better because again, it doesn't crack. Because, um, yeah. Wait, so you're saying the colloidal silica you heat that, and that's what centers it together to a hard, um, hard form, or is well, that just the binder for other materials? Uh, you have two particles: large particles of silica and the colloidal particles of silica, mm -hmm. and um, typically, and the. Uh, the small particles sinter much faster, but so they they certainly help with the sintering process uh, to glue everything together. But their main role is to to just act like a glue at room temperature, so that when you melt out the wax, mm -hmm. they still have this physical structure, the shell, and then that stays together long enough for everything to sinter together. When you so, bake it at uh, red hot. Right. Well, I mean, if we have a small furnace, like say we do want to just try a sample small object, you know, just a small electric furnace that gets you up to a thousand Celsius or so. Um, yeah. Is this material just, we want? Is this colloidal silica? We well, add sand to this? so we. Do I, I wouldn't buy that stuff. Um, you can actually get the actual binder. And, uh, Where do you get that? You can, What's it called? Uh, you can yeah. Um, we'll just call it colloidal silica binder for investment casting. Mm -hmm. But and I would you have to get a sample of. But I, I did find actually I did shop around and there was a company that was happy to send me a liter 
of it, and they could certainly send more. Um, I can ding them up out of my email. Um, yeah, that's a possibility to just basically try to clone the conventional industrial investment casting process on a small scale. It's an interesting idea. Well, um, but, so I mean, if you've got this binder, so what are you binding with binder? Is it sand? Um, yeah, it'd be refined sand. You'd want a little bit of refinement to it, like uh, get rid of some of the impurities and stuff. But that's basically it. Usually it's silica, so it would be sand. But sometimes you use zirconia or even graphite. Right. Well, I mean, we Depends could... Your... I mean, that's, that's another route to go. We just need to... Uh, let's see. And otherwise, is there any other material like that you can get at the store, like a block that we can just, like mill out or, or just shape so the basic thing we want to show is that when you mig into a well-defined shape you're capable of doing that that means the metal actually takes up all the cracks and, and comes out exactly as that shape that we just want to show that with any material um can well, you I think, think of any other material that already comes as a solid thing that would work that would basically wouldn't crack under under mig welding they um, well, I think the best is probably just to take the uh, refractory stuff that you can buy on Amazon. It says like it's making for making fire bricks or making uh, pizza ovens and stuff, and probably that would probably work okay. Yeah, I think for that application, you'd make them. You'd either make a you'd make a mold of it with uh, 3D printed object, burn out the 3D printed object. That's probably the easiest. These colloidal silica bonded systems are they're not going to be really that easy to make, right. and it takes a long for you to make a, a shell right, because right. you have to make the coats. You, dunk, you dunk it in the slurry and you dry it out and you dunk it again eight, eight times and it takes hours to dry each time. And that's uh, kind of complicated. I wouldn't right. sure if that's a good idea. So if you just want to get to the point, that's mm -hmm. not the best part. You so what is the simplest up. refractory cement we could get that's like right off online? Um, yeah, I would go Amazon.com refractory cement and Try to get some that actually tells you the composition. Uh, yeah, that's the sort of thing. Um, the buff is the lowest grade. Uh, Three pound castable refractory cement dry mix, ten bucks. At a store yeah. nearby. And then, oh, I see. Wait a second. Resist temperatures up to one thousand two hundred degrees Celsius. It still melts at one thousand three hundred. Ah, yeah. So, so I wouldn't do it. So that's not good. But there's going to be some other ones that are probably okay, um, and it'll depend um, on their composition. See if you can maybe find something that does goes up to fourteen or fifteen hundred. Okay. That. I do remember seeing some. Yeah. So yeah, I can send a link to that and we could probably just try that pretty quickly. I think I, I might have done so. I don't remember when I sent that email. But no yeah. I'll I'll try to double check that and see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's see how that works. Okay. Yeah, so let's let's keep moving on. Yeah. Um Ruslan, do you have any any updates on your side? No. You're just uh, coming for the ride today. How's how's work for you? You, uh, you still have job? <laughs> oh, I write you more in email about my current situation. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully this was at least somewhat entertaining for you today to sit in and <laughs> see what we've got going. Um, yes, uh, I I began uh, to do uh, to work more actively on my project. Uh, last weeks I spent to fix some bugs and to um, uh, put uh, I think workbench. Mm -hmm. uh, to new uh, free cat. so I hope it still works on old version. Otherwise, let let know. Okay, let's see. Uh, did you document this April twenty third? Oh yes. Uh, Typing uh, workbench, uh, nice. Uh, okay. Last entries in my log. Yeah. I do. Yeah, it's good. And, uh, uh, did you? I have a question for you on this, since you're the master of the, of um, mathematical description of physical objects. So, what about? Finally. Yeah. Um, 
What about uh, the, the kinds of gears that are found in planetary gears, like those herringbone gears? One thing that we could really use, and I was trying to look for this, is uh, so planetary gear generator in FreeCAD. Um, in FreeCAD. Because uh, we got a master's. I, I looked at some stuff, and they have they have that within um, OpenSCAD. But just when you have OpenSCAD, it's just hard to work with that in FreeCAD because you can only export STLs. Um, now look at this FreeCAD. They have an involute gear, ge or was it called um, involute gear generator? They have this. You see, um, that's the profile of what planetary gear could be. Um, mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you, um, if you do. Uh, can we do a double herringbone, herringbone gear? So herringbone gear. Have you heard of herringbone gear? Um, I, I never have never wrote any scripts for gear. And I didn't calculate gears, but uh, explain the problem. Hi again, internet ideas. people. Uh, yeah, I we want to have access to generating. So see this kind of a gear. Yeah. These. They're called herringbone gears because they they have two angles. What that means that they they prevent thrust like along the axis. They basically mm -hmm. center the. It doesn't move back and forth, so it's it's like it's it's got a built-in thrust bearing. But anyway, to do this to generate planetary gears, because uh, I don't know if you so planetary 3D print, pr printed planetary gear. We can get this design. Oh, let me see. Let me go back to planetary. I want to show you this because I want to test you this. One option might be that I can model it for you in Fusion 360. Gears. What we need is a generator that we can. That would be FreeCAD. Um, yeah. Open SCAD generator, planetary gears. Let me find another one. There's a gear, planetary gear down that I like. I want to print that for a small stepper motor. Um, I think uh, this open scat thing is sufficient for 3D printing, but is the purpose to have it in FreeCAD? Well, if you want to modify it readily in FreeCAD and you don't know how to do it in open scat, otherwise you have to work it, do all the modification on open scat. You know what I mean? Yes, or, or probably um, I think export in some format you can use um, in FreeCAD a mesh maybe and then yeah, you will except switch it's back not, except that doesn't work so so the problem statement is so so I've got okay. files for this in, in step you can and so the recommended pathway is so I want to actually do this but I want to modify this so we can do whatever we want like this doesn't really have a the proper geometry say we want to modify it and put a bigger shaft on or whatever um, the thing you can do, you can add shapes to to STL files. You can put things on top of it, but you can't subtract from them as STLs. So you can convert them to step within FreeCAD. But the FreeCAD converter from STL to step, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I tried one of these gears here. It just wouldn't work. It just crashed on me. So uh, it seems like FreeCAD is the best tool to do that. And I think actually Fusion 360 has it. But idea that we can then turn it to step or, or FreeCAD format, then you can modify it in all kinds of ways. Uh, that's why we'd want to have a FreeCAD generator so we don't have to go through SDL files. We just literally, it's it's just so hard to work with them. They, a lot of times they just don't work. You you try to turn it into a solid, you just can't. It crashes. Because a lot of times it's uh, a broken geometry. You know? I have two uh, problems to, uh, to cut. Uh, or to use, um, oh, to, to be more precise, to use, um, to combine parts in FreeCAD. And uh, make, make something very simple, like cylinder minus uh, sphere. Sometimes you, you will see some strange artifacts when, when you create, for example, an any bowl, mm -hmm. and you cannot see through, through it. Uh, because there are some bugs in the representation of FreeCAD. Yeah, 
Well, that's that's the workflow, the Boolean workflow. The workflow that works really well is pads and pockets. That typically works really well. Um, so, yeah, I tried. I took one of these gears here and I tried to convert it to solid, but I couldn't. Yeah, which means that you cannot sub, but you can't subtract from STLs. They still have to be converted to solids. You can add to STLs by just superposing something on it and just selecting those both objects, but you can't just cut one from the other. So, anyway, that's... And what is the advantage of, of subtraction? Subtraction? Sorry, say it again. Uh, what is the advantage to have a, uh, to be able to subtract? Right, zero right. Zero. Like for example, if I wanted to insert a bushing in here, I can do that. But if I wanted to, um, like, just what's a good example for subtraction? Like, say you want to put a bolt hole through it you know, to put a set screw in it. You can't. So that would be a subtraction yeah. to make a screw or hole. Pushing that was and uh, what is uh, the general purpose of of, uh, of being able to uh, to represent such kind of a gear in a free cat to use it only as a placeholder as uh, a schematic or no, you, it's, do it's... you need to have a really um, really realistic that you can reprint it uh, yeah for 3d printing because this is the kind of stuff oh, okay. we would actually want to 3D print, yeah. yeah. But basically, like, we want to mm -hmm. start getting to modify this. Like, for example, if you... This is a three-fold gear down, so it already makes an EMA 17 motor quite much stronger, but then you can keep stacking it. You can keep putting on a next bigger one to get very high gear down. It will be much slower, but it will have very high torque, which is um. very desirable. I, I think it's not possible with the material which we use. Um, That's the, the plastic right. and the non non homogeneous extruded plastic. It will just break. We need to think if it uh, uh, applies from pra pragmatical point of view. Maybe it, uh, it is not for us to do it. It's a matter of, of design. It's. I mean, we know there's certain. You know, you've got five thousand psi on plastic here you can do some i mean of course you can't do like steel which is 10 times that but can do some useful things you can definitely do like for example if we talk about a very simple take the limit using this stepper motor to drive the precious plastic from a shredder at a very slow speed you can do that you can just size when you size these things up they will still be precise enough and meshed well enough uh, to work for a higher torque. It's just a matter of their how big they are. If you have a big printer, you can print these things bigger, right? I mean, there's people who show that you make, you know, on YouTube who show a drill-driven winch that pulls a car. That's 3D printed. Now, maybe that, that would last forever, but but the point is that you can get them very high torques, and if you keep it within an acceptable torque, you're good. So there is a realm of application that is useful. It's not like it's just you, not to useful. use it for cordless drill. Uh, in case like this, that's the potential use. I mean, he, right here you've got a three-fold gear down. This, this is one example. This you can put an extruder, like typically if uh, an extruder has to gear down, with this you don't need to gear down anymore. And this worked perfectly. Like for example, the the Titan Aero extruder is at a 3D, uh, it's a plastic, it's, a, it's actually a plastic on a little three-fold gear down or so, three or four-fold gear down. This could replace that. So, in other words, you can do some things that uh, are very practical. Like you can make a functional extruder using this. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to use this motor, the gear down, so that I don't have to use another gear down for the extruder. Mm -hmm. Like for like, this is a weighed extruder here in this picture. They use this small gear to drive this bigger wheel, 
with with like I don't know five or so gear down uh, for an extruder application because you need a lot of force to push the filament through. Uh, so mm -hmm. applications like that are completely doable, and there, there's some things that that are practical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now and then, of course, you get into the idea that if you do the lost PLA casting, you can start turning that into mills. Um, mm -hmm. And it could be a base for if you, you might have to finish machine later on, but if you're almost there in a shape, it's called nearness shape, uh, where it's close to the finished shape, that, that is a very useful thing if you can do that in metal. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, anyway, on that part regarding the, uh, it would be good to have a way to do that easily in FreeCAD. And it looks like the uh, part of that is is there with this involute gear, because I think you can just extrude that and twist it, I think, and then you mm -hmm. can put two of those together to make a hang bone gear. It seems like so that that that's one way to do it, uh -huh. probably. And uh, what is the mathematical part of it? Well, the mathematical part would be to uh, s to size it to do that automatically. I mean, just do that to, so you can generate basically based on given radius, given angle of the herringbone, and there's a lot of variations you can have that. Um, you want a parametrically driven, yeah, uh, parametric herringbone planetary gear, right? Yeah, which is fine. Yeah, something you totally do is just not the way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah, so that'll be that's something to to develop as well. I was just gonna bring that up. Mm -hmm. That'd be cool to see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's practical. Like right now, I'm like for example, I can find this thing online, this this thing. But if it didn't exist online, you know, it'd take me forever to design this from scratch. Um, oh, it took a few good days to do that. Yeah. 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 But um, yeah. What are your uh, What are your next plans on some of the work with piping? Or are you done with that? Or do you have a? Uh, yes, I am. I'm uh, in the phase where I, I I'm done since. And uh, then, then I try to fix stuff and to adopt yeah, yeah. and support, and then, uh, so, and then I spend time for for finishing the finished product. I it's probably I will I will finish it all my life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What What is your you thinking about? Um... What are you thinking next for OSC-related work? Uh, anything in your... I, I, want, um, I want to um, to make some experiments with a 3D printer, which uh, Herman uh, gave me. I made some uh, printing experiment that doesn't look great. Uh, mm -hmm. No, it doesn't look good at all, mm -hmm. because I... Uh, I uh, for transportation, Herman uh, disassembled uh, yeah. the 3D printer. And when I assembled, uh, all the uh, important calibration uh, was gone. And I I don't know how to, de uh, to make proper uh, Z-axis leveling. And uh, I think I, uh, this is, uh, I, I think, the most important uh, Step. I need uh, to find out how, how to do it. Yeah. Do so the, some... Yeah. His version. He was. I'm sure he was using the baby spin correction. But there's a thing in Marlin. If you take download version 1902, um, there's baby stepping correction, which 1902? makes. Yeah. You spoke in the, the beginning of the video, but uh, can you post a link there? Yeah. Link is there, and I believe that I mean the manual has the full instructions on how to do. Let me just verify that. 
uh, 3D printer manual should have the detailed instructions for how you use the baby stepping correction. If it's not, we should definitely add that, but I thought we had that in there. Let's see. Uh, when you do your uh, 3D assembly. printing workshop at the end, uh, do you have a printer which can print parts yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. with software, not, not only uh, mechanical parts? Oh yeah, we go all the way right now, for example, in the last workshop, we go all the way, you, you uh, do the final build, print the test cubes, and then the first first print, you adjust the baby stepping to get the first layer correct, and it works right there. Uh -huh. so, Precisely step step. I need to get the um, fall I mean, I, I've not really found the... Yeah, I think I'm looking at this manual though. Bit ago. Uh, right. I guess it's not in there. What is this? Let's see. Baby stepping. Let me look at my log. Maybe we, maybe we never got to that. Let me see. Baby stepping. Jonathan, John, you're saying you haven't seen it, right? Yeah, I don't recall seeing anything about baby oh, stuff, but you know, I looked okay. through the, you know, the manual. Had a nice manual that Sarah may have worked on. She yeah. was around. Okay. Um, yeah, no, you're right. That's a big gap because that because right now the process is very simple. Um, no, we gotta have some documentation on the wiki. Let's see, let's see what we have for. D3D E1902, any mention of that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess yeah. if you had like, exactly what you use with the people in the workshop, I mean, that'd be helpful because a lot of you just explain huh. it to them, I think. This would, would, would be very great if you have this kind of instruction in one way. Because, yeah, uh, I, I can continue with my uh, 3D print, uh, print experiments only because of this uh, this last missing step. Okay, let's let's see. Uh, I thought I had that documented. Let's get the genealogy. So, um, let's see if it's under 1812. No, I don't see it here either. So that Z, the Z height thing doesn't necessarily solve the problems. The uh, Z height calibration, you have to do this other process as well to help. Because, I mean, there's some things I, I feel like I need to document because, you know, in addition to this, like I know that whole thing for, for calibrating your extruder steps per millimeter. Hmm. Like, like, there's a whole bunch of these little. Yeah, no, I'm not seeing this. I, <laughs> oh man, no, that's a big gap. We need to document that whole thing. Of, um, that, yeah, so if you build up, Marcin, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in the E-Steps calibration too that I use, and then you can get this this kind of you know final. You know, I guess like if we just had a single pager, yeah, or like whatever you're done with, here's what you do to get it. Here's your startup procedure, and it's going to be pretty agnostic to the printer, I think. Using so there's some basic calibration stuff that I know, and you know, this baby stuff thing seems interesting. There are uh, printers um, from other companies, and uh, they have uh, this mechanical leveling. You, you have some kind of uh, three wheels, and then you can adjust your, your bed in such a way that you barely touch the nozzle. Right. But in our case, we, we don't have this uh, mechanical adjustment. We, we need to do some uh, some adjustment with software, and this is what I cannot do. Right. Um, oh, uh, do we want to add some mechanical adjustment later? You can, but okay. there's no need to complicate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just another complication. No, it's simpler than that. It's but it just needs to be documented. 
Um, okay. Let me see. I'm I'm looking through my log and I could have sworn I wrote that some a guide on that somewhere. Um, build procedure. Let me see this. Yeah, 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 okay. There's a little bit on... Um, I'll, I'll pull that all together, because, yeah, we did document some of that in the when we were doing, like, the, the guide for certifying people how to build printers. Um, yeah, okay, we have some of it. I'll, I'll pull it together, and maybe for next meeting uh, we can go over that. It will be good. Okay, let's go over that for next Thank meeting. You. I'll prepare that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's under the, so around September, October, November, yeah, I'll do that, I'll prepare, uh, cause it's, it's there, but it's hidden, it's under, like, certification, some of the certification pages, where, certification, V3D certification, build procedure, there's some, okay, I'll, I'll pull it together, that needs to go definitely into the 3D printer manual, and prom perhaps at the end there where it finishes with the software, then it's uh, time to actually say here's the final procedure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's cover that next time. <clears throat> All right. Yes. Okay. So we'll do that uh, for next time. And yeah, so let's leave it off here. And um, yeah, we'll see you then in a week. And talk about calibration procedures. And probably have my printer, the latest edition, working by that time. So we'll probably take a look at that as well. I can maybe I can demonstrate. <laughs> you love it. I mean, it's like we spend a lot of time just refining that. And right now, I mean, before you used to take about an hour. Now it takes like first time, and it works like five minutes. It's it's part of the first print, and and when you follow the build procedure correctly, it's it comes up perfect because uh, yeah. you make the final adjustment live on the first print. Yeah. Yeah. So the fi the final adjustment and the calibration cube and then like the STL file for that and just the general startup procedure and just other calibrations. Right. Otherwise, but, uh, I mean, because the one thing, the real the real quick thing here is this other thing. The whole build process is lots of our stuff for our firmwares we're releasing are, um, you know, we're unspecified and for for documentation, I, you know, there's no reason I can't take care of that as well. Like for instance, I think. E steps and um, the steps we use for universal access are pretty consistent. The machine sizes, but lots of that's been, you know, in the manual. But well, I guess I mean, the manual. The babies that... But hold on for a sec. Yeah. So, so the D3 genealogy page, it we list things by machine. So with each machine, come very specific settings, sizes, and whatever is unique to that machine. So you have to follow that just for that. So for, say for D3D 1810. That's relevant for that, but say, Ruslan, for yours, you're going back to an earlier version, so we have to look at that. But but in any case, the proceed like if you have an older version, the the goal is still to upgrade the firmware to the yeah. latest. Yes, I think so, it's like the process for making a built machine that someone has built, and basically how. Do you you uh, your machine to uh, update the firmware is that a defined process like uh, if you build a new extruder type and you yeah. need to you know, the e steps per milliliter for the extruder or you have modified some uh, you know teaching people basic yeah, yeah, yeah. that kind of stuff I, I think I, could, I might try to take a stab at that because that's the kind of thing I'm going to sort of get into when I'm starting to have with different serial numbers for machines for ZMES I mean 
I have to basically, you know, one of those assembly instructions is take an Arduino and one of the parts is going to be a non-physical part, which is software that needs loaded. <laughs> and yeah. you know I, mean? I got to load all these different config params in those. Yeah. Probably through a script. No, but, but you are pointing out that I'm thinking, so I've done it so many times that, that I was like, it skipped me that we didn't, don't even have this in, properly documented in the main manual. But yeah, that needs yeah. to get in there. Mm. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, that's something. If you can give us a shell, um, you know, yeah. I try to make commitments to say, hey, I'll fill it in, you know, but let's see. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I'll work on that. That's, I, I need to do that because, I mean, I have the overview of all the different things that have happened in the history, so... Uh, yeah, I could do that. That's not a problem. That has to be done. All right. Well, let's leave it at that. Let's let's get to the next meeting. We'll get into into that. So thanks a lot. Yeah, let's uh, call it until next time. Okay. Bye, everyone. It's good talking to you. Bye, everyone.